Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Red Ice Radio. I'm Henrik. Thank you for being here with us. RedEyes.tv is the website. Please check in frequently for radio shows, videos, our live TV show, news, and more. Well, today our guest is Tom Sunik, who's back on the show with us. He's the author of Against Democracy and Equality, The European New Right. He's also written Homo Americanus, Child of the Postmodern Age. He has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Also, the research and study group for European civilization is kind of another faction, another group that has formed around this line of thinking pertaining to the new right. Uh, welcome back, Tom Sunik. Good to speak with you again. Well, thank you for your invitation. I appreciate it. And all the best to your colleagues and our colleagues and our listeners. Very good. Thank you so much for being here. I wanted to speak with you today. Uh, there's a number of issues, of course, that have occurred since you were last on the show, not not the least the uh, migration crisis, of course, a, a tremendous amount of pressure has been put on Europe, the infrastructure, the the people, and, and we're going to speak a bit about some of the reactions to this and, and how things are going to formulate uh, the coming years uh, post-migrant crisis. And it doesn't look like it's going to slow down either, so we'll get, get into that. But one of the things I wanted to address here in the beginning is pertaining to the new right in in Europe and, and and I guess some of the some of the thoughts that has led in this direction because we've seen of course a, a, a tremendous growth of the alternative right or the alt right movement in America this has of course taken roots in Europe to a certain extent as well and the school of new right political thought if you will has obviously emerged out of the environment of I'd say France primarily late 60s or so but I thought it would be good to go back a bit and remember some of the tenets and, and, and where some of these ideas come from, Tom. And of course, you're very well versed in a lot of these ideas. You've been involved with a lot of the movements, etc. How would you describe to the listener uh, what the what the you know going back to the origins of the new right, what that really is? Mm -hmm. Well, let us first start with uh, some concepts, with the clarification of some concepts. And I, unfortunately, I need to go a little bit into the etymology of the word the new right and alt right as well. And before, after that, we can look a little bit more at the substance and what the ideas are behind, which fuel this so quote unquote alt right and new right. Now, as far as the new right is concerned, and as you may well remember, I wrote a book about this. Was the, originally this was my doctoral dissertation back in '88 in California, the University of California. The new right. This was this is now the term that is associated with Alain de Benoit to some extent, of course, with myself and with other people, especially in France, but to some extent also in. Germany and in England as well. However, keep in mind that the term the new right was not launched by Alain de Benoit or for that matter by myself. It was basically launched, it was, uh, how can I say, it was uh, it was crafted by the hostile media late in the late 70s. Right. It had a somewhat pejorative meaning at that time and it still does have a pejorative meaning and pejorative significance rather because this is not certainly the term I would love to use. Well, I have to use it one way or another, because being now tossed into this category of the new right, I have to use it one way or another. Although I myself, including Alain de Benoit, we have been constantly harping on this issue. No, this is not the right term, because we are neither left, we are no, neither nor on the right side. We are in the in between, in our, in our way. So please, folks, do avoid using this term, the new right. So we basically have to use this new right by default, if you wish. Having said that, I certainly need to commend my colleague, by the way, Richard Spencer. I think this is a very appropriate expression, a very appropriate denomination alt-right because it sounds less pejorative it sounds it sounds more neutral so it's certainly it's a better we weapon if i can put it that way somewhat metaphorically against our detractors and our and our enemies and i presume also this is going to gather momentum also in europe because as you certainly know richard spencer and the alt-right as, as a phenomenon has been has hit the news or not just in the states but also in england and here in france and in eastern europe as well yeah. everybody talks now about the alt-right and i indeed think this is a very appropriate uh, term now for denoting for uh, how can i say for depicting 
not just a political movement, but also a cultural movement, an activist movement, and also a dissident, a, a, a non-conformist movement. This is something we need to underline, not just for our listeners, but also to, to the fake media, to the main media. We have to tell them we are a non-conformist movement. We are not necessarily uh, abiding by what you think we are on the right wing, because those words now, after the Cold War has been over for 25 years now, have absolutely no more meaning. I mean, I myself, I just don't want to talk about myself, but generally speaking, we people in Europe and in the United States, we are just as much opposed against uh, against communism as we are against liberalism. So this uh, certainly does not qualify us to be categorized or qualified as, uh, as some right-wingers, because as, as I'm sure you will agree with me, the term right-winger has a very pejorative and very negative uh, connotation. So we can start with that, and I, I certainly like talking about those semantic problems because everything is semantics. Yeah, definitely. I, I understand that. And of course, there's many components and tenants, which is very anti, you know, commercialism. It's anti the, the kind of materialism that we've seen come out of liberalism, etc. And, and I think most people on the left would consider, you know, commercialism or capitalism to, to be you know, more on the right, if you will. And these, you know, these these words, of course, they hold certain historically certain certain meaning. I, I think there's some truth, of course, to say that the line of thought that we're discussing weighs heavier on the right side of, of politics may, than maybe than on the left. But but what do you, what would you say are some of the of how this how this got started? You said that there was basically a hostile press that put this term on on a new line of thinkers that arose out of Europe with Delaine de Benoit, as you mentioned. And some others. What what were some of the ideas at that time that was discussed? What were some of the central points at that point? Well, okay. Now let's try to just uh, backpedal a little bit back into the seventies and early eighties when the, everybody in France back then was talking about the new right, the new right. And of course, there was this inevitable nomen of fascism, neo-fascism, and what have you. I and mean, this is a standard vocabulary, the standard lexicon. Uh, used by by the hostile media, and it's still being used that fashion. So even as I said earlier, this this expression, the new right, has a still a rather negative uh, uh, negative connotation. Now I just need to to tell you one thing, which is quite important. I also think this is a rather ambiguous expression because again, in the United States of America, it's just a little bit of grammar. We need to we need to backpedal a little bit into into neoconservatives as well. I'm sure you realize that most of our American listeners and who are in the states, of course, they realize that the new right is a also an expression often uh, used in depicting the neocons. And I've seen it many many times in neo in commentary in Forward Journal back in the uh, back in the 80s and 90s. So I definitely, if I can just my, make my own summary, I certainly prefer the term alt right. Now, as far as the ideas are concerned, look, this is something <clears throat> on a purely psychological level. I guess I, I need to frame it in a, in a, in a decent, in a comprehensible fashion. Uh, on a purely psychological level, whatever I say, however many disclaimers I may make that I'm not on the right side, that I'm not on the left side, my enemies, my detractors, or the mainstream media now, this including the Huffington Post, who do here and there they quote me sometimes in a very in a negative sort of a um, how can I say context. They will always always call us call us with those standards uh, lump words uh, words like 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 white supremacists or white nationalists or anti-Semites. This is a standard word that they're tossing around in order to discredit us. Now, from, again, from the psychological level, if those people, of course, they don't have solid arguments, and uh, and since they don't have solid arguments, then they use those those shut up words like anti-Semites, white uh, white nationalists, or white supremacists. These are very very bad words. And my opinion is, in fact, this is what I'm also suggesting to some of your listeners: the more you try to make the, of those your disclaimers, the more you tr the more you defend yourself, the less if, uh, the the less the less uh, less. Um, success you will have. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So we just you know. have to put up with that yeah. and just show by our deeds, by our actions, by our literature, by our massive amount of, uh, why not, to hear our heritage, by our knowledge, by our prominent uh, thinkers and, and scholars, that uh, we are simply something unique and something really, uh, uh, something which is not, uh, 
which does not abide with this political correct, with this political correct and self-censored uh, uh, monologues of, of the mainstream media. You know, one of the things I like them with the alternative right or alt right, uh, uh, you know, name is that it also kind of hinges a little bit on some of the other kind of alternative movements that we've seen, not the least with with the alternative news uh, media that actually has risen out, uh, risen up in, in the last few years, which has been tremendously successful. And I think we've seen just actually in the last few months now, Tom, a kind of a, a pushback against this. I'm, I'm reminded of things such as not only, of course, Twitter censoring people, but Google has started to kind of implement a, or they're going to a kind of an algorithm uh, for accuracy's sake. And Facebook has done the same. It's they ask the reader to judge the story as true or false. It goes right in line with these claims of so-called fake news that we see as an attempt, I think, by the liberal world order to fight back against a rising opposition to their hegemony of ideas. And and okay. this is a pushback. Uh, and, and I would liken that, you know, a lot of these thoughts are, are connected with also the alternative news medium that has risen up with the, with the Internet, that there's so many cells and different kind of factions to this that are fighting back. I don't know if we could call them all... Alt right, of course, uh, but it's all an expression of a very anti-establishment line of thinking, which I think has been actually very, uh, very successful so far. What would you say to that? Absolutely. Well, as I said earlier, like alt right, I certainly would find another synonym, and namely the the nonconformist right, if I could put it that way. And one thing we also have to single out, which I think is very very important, is that namely this mainstream media, or let's call it the system media. I call it the system, Lügenpress, as the Germans call it, or the fecal press, not just the fake press, the fake media, but the fecal media as well. They have discredited themselves. All those folks, their correspondents, those scribes, the what I call them, the journals. They, they don't want to admit it in public, but the very fact, and we have it now, quite, we, have, we have seen it recently in, in, in the States uh, with, the, with the Trump phenomenon, that uh, despite this huge amount of, of, um, of um, how can I say, politically correct uh, uh, media reports against Trump, uh, they very few people have actually uh, been uh, have uh, actually paid attention to it. As you said very well, we, we are now resorting to alternative media. So okay, next to alt right, we also have alternative media, including the red eyes as well. You know, which certainly function as a good source of information and not just information, but also a source of, of critical thought. And I guess this is something we need to, to bank on. This is something we have to rely upon. And again, the, the media, the mainstream media, be it in Stockholm or be it here in Croatia, or for that matter, be it in Washington, D.C., is, is panicky. They are not happy about this because they can no longer mold the opinion of the populace, including the younger people, especially, as they've been doing over the last 70 years, since 1945. Again, we could now backpedal again and basically argue, I don't want to sound too bombastic with some of my with some of my expressions, but basically what we are witnessing is another w form of warfare. Warfare, which actually didn't stop in 1945, is just continuing, of course, by using different methods and different means. And this is exactly we're witnessing this on a daily basis, as I said, not just in the D.C., but also here in Croatia. Yeah, it's a cultural war. It's an information war. Uh, it, it's, I think a lot of things have actually crystallized post so-called migration crisis when um, the borders were, were totally opened and, and the sign, the signal was sent for all these people from uh, the Middle East, North Africa, even Central Asia to come to Europe, and, and we've seen a tremendous amount of mounting of, of problem in the wake of this, of course, Tom, which has been tremendously dramatic. It's been tremendously painful, and it's been it, it saddened me to see all this. At the same time, we've seen a kind of a realization on people on people's parts, which which I never knew or never expected to kind of rise up against these kinds of issues. They they where they previously were very refrained to address these kinds of issues or didn't think much of it. Many people started to realize that it was almost like that this was intentional somehow, that it was it was meant that Europe was to be flooded by all these foreigners and incompatible cultures. And the the problems that we've seen has caused a lot of people to to wake up. So there is some there is some there is some good, if you will, with such a negative event. But how do you view the migrant crisis and how this have changed the environment? So I think it's very I think it's responsible, highly, highly responsible for 
having a lot of people coming over to our side, if you will. What do you think? Well, that's a good point. You, 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 you made a very good point by stating that every cloud has a silver, a silver lining. You know, <laughs> like uh, indeed, I'm very happy to to admit that. Um, thanks, if I can put it somewhat ironically, or sarcastically, rather. I'm sorry that thanks to this um, uh, this huge floods of uh, of uh, non-European. Uh, let's call them not migrants, let's call them invaders, <laughs> coming to Europe especially over, over this route, the Balkan route, and then across the, the across the Mediterranean basin as well. People, even apolitical whites, even apolitical uh, uh, Europeans, regardless whether they come from Corsica or from, uh, from Flanders or from, or from uh, Sweden in Göteborg or in, or in, or in wherever, in, let alone Frankfurt you know, or in Marseille, which is one third, one third Arab populated, Muslim populated. Really? <laughs> now they're yeah. to wake up in and be folks, even folks who, who, who never paid any attention, who don't read at all, if you want to put it that way, just realize that they are physically being threatened, that, they are, that their jobs and that their security is not the same as it used to be. And I look at the irony of history that now man, many of those Pegida folks in Germany, I don't know if you guys noticed back there in the States or in, in Stockholm, wherever you may be now at this stage, uh, they had those big uh, billboards and those big uh, posters uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, signs on it and with, uh, with words like, uh, Gorbachev, come and save us from from capitalism and from migration. <laughs> in other words, now they want to roll back all those uh, all those. Uh, uh, how can I say those non-communist days and years, and return back to Eastern Europe when it was safe and sound? Because at least it was the irony of history; it was protected by communist tanks yeah. against refugees. Yeah. So this is another irony of history. And I guess the good point. Let me put it somewhat on the, on the optimistic on the optimistic level. The good point of this migrations of this of this floods of this non-European floods into Europe is that people are waking up. Uh, people are waking up, young folks are waking up, they realize on a purely logistical level, let's forget now about the ideology of somebody's fascist or right, whatever those words may mean now, they realize that they are no longer the same, that their security is threatened, that their transportation is, doesn't work the same way, and that they're getting more and more distrustful of each other. So I guess, as I said, the it might uh, it might uh, it might morph into a positive situation for all of us, and as I said earlier, every every cloud has a silver lining. And again, the good point I wanted to make this at the beginning, folks, let us not despair. I don't want to sound now like a Bible preacher. There is always history is always open, you know. Like uh, let me put it that way, like. Um, 30 years ago, I was still in the States. Nobody could predict that the, the communism would fall apart, that the Berlin Wall would fall apart in 88, okay? But it did. So again, uh, with a little bit of courage, with a little bit of, of, of bravery on our side, I could, we could certainly uh, 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 push the history, the course of history in our direction. I don't want to now, we'll, we'll talk about this later on, but I certainly i am I'm, I'm positive about this uh, about this whole issue about migration, regardless of the fact that at the present this is causing a great deal of problems. Now, one other thing I need to, to, to say, and I'm sure you will agree with you, and most of your, uh, your readers and listeners will agree with me, look, we knew that. I mean, I knew that. I mean, I knew that multiculturalism could not function. There, there are lots of books about this. There are very, books very well written, including myself. I wrote quite a, quite a few of uh, uh, essays and a, couple, a book also on this uh, failure of multiculturalism. We knew that 30, 40 years ago, look, uh, uh, that this multiculturalism it has to lead inevitably to a uh, to tensions and possibly civil wars. Look at ex Yugoslavia, of course, in a somewhat different level. It was a country that was put together back in 45, you know. Uh, it was a mishmash country. Nobody even consulted different constituent peoples whether they wanted to live together or not. And it ended up in what? In a terrible civil war. Yeah, that's so right. Again, imagine what might happen tomorrow at, at, uh, in Gothenburg or in, or in Frankfurt. Oh, it's, right? it's already happening. Look at it. This is low-intensity conflict going on. And I'm sure there are people in the system. I'm sure pretty much there are people in the system in Sweden itself, regardless of those sellouts. We're not going to now use those bad words against them. Of course, they're mostly they're sellouts. They make good monies. They live in good quarters. They live in posh, posh neighborhoods, what they call the quarters. The French call it quarters. They live in white, posh neighborhoods. They send their kids to good Catholic schools or whatever. But they are aware 
of the fact, on a purely logistical level, let's leave aside their, their ideological now framework, on a purely logistical level, it cannot function. Look at South Africa, it's fallen apart, nobody's is talking about this in the open. Look at ex-Yugoslavia I mentioned, look at the balkanization of the United States of America. I noticed that the balkanization of the United States in the early 80s, when I lived in southern LA, you know, look, you notice that people are distressful of each other. So again, this is a very heavy issue and what I'm scared of, you look, and we got to address this issue separately. I don't want to now blame the Muslims or blame the Arabs or blame the whatever blacks or the, the Asians. Of course, this is the first, uh, uh, how do I say, gut reaction. You don't like people who don't belong to your tribe. You, you, you don't like the lingo. You don't like the accents. Yeah, I mean, they, they just don't belong here. But you got to ask yourself a question. Who brought them here in the first place? Who is actually uh, providing the terrain, the psychological and the ideological terrain to bring them over here? Who is actually promising them this la-la land, which is never going to materialize for those, for those Ahmeds or whatever their name may be, and who are coming out from all parts of Asia and Africa? To, to, what do you expect them to, to, to wipe the, the rears of some old ladies in some Catholic uh, senior citizen home back in Frankfurt? Do you expect them to go and get them to work? I mean, look, I don't want to sound vulgar, but you understand the point. Sure. Those folks... They're, they're just from different culture. This is a different mindset. This is a different gene pool. And I'm sure that many, many people, and this is what hurts me most, and I really get emotional when I talk about it, those bunch of liars, not just in the European Union, but also sitting in the, oh, what what is the, the Swedish word for the for Swedish parliament, or yeah, folks, folks, whatever you call it, or the Bundesrat in Germany. Yeah, they're aware of that. Yeah. Yes, Privately, those, you know, I can tell you now, as a, I used to be a former Croatian diplomat, I can tell you what, what diplomats tell me in private and what they tell me in public. It's entirely two different things. Yeah. So don't, folks, don't believe a word what they are saying, especially what this mainstream media is all about. It's a big, big, I hate to say it, mendacity. It's a liberal mendacity, and this mendacity has been going on since 1944. For 1945. Now, one privilege I had back in communist Yugoslavia, where I grew up before I went, where before I moved to the states, was that we could realize those. We knew that those folks were con men, those apparatchiks, those bureaucrats. We knew that they were liars because they didn't believe themselves into a single word of what they were saying on all wavelengths in communist Yugoslavia. But the problem is now you have the same thing back in Sweden and back in Germany, or for that matter, in the United States of America, where those media. And I'm sure even folks from the Huffington Post, I know some of them, they just have to, how can I say, regurgitate all those fancy words of equality, of egalitarianism, of economism, and they don't even believe in that. They believe as long as they get paid for it, you see. So they are watchdogs of the system. <laughs> I'm sorry, I sort of got a little bit <laughs> sidetracked, but I just need to express that, you know. So you don't expect those people, we are talking about the replacement of the big replacement of the people, okay? Yeah. Now imagine one million people have already only in last year but don't keep in mind that there were already seven million non-european people in western germany in germany prior to this arrival yeah. and notice that now this salami tactics you know salami tactics stopped now thanks god we see this what it really means this replacement of the people it's actually how can i say it's a suicide of europe and this is something what i'm afraid of well, again i we can focus that, and I'll let you ask me a question on that. Do not blame the Arabs or the Muslims, of course. Those folks, of course, we know that they don't belong to our tribe. Yeah. But you have to blame. We have to actually castigate. We have to actually accuse and hold responsible the white decadent elites, the traitors, if you wish, who are basically uh, conducting an, uh, a suicidal policies against all European peoples, not just against the German people, but also all against all European peoples, including, of course, white people in, in the United States of America. And also, of course, those who have nestled their way into our cultural framework and our moral framework, who have changed our attitudes, who have, you know, designed it the, the, with the media, with the cultural dialogue and the framework in such a way that Many of these politicians have arisen to the the position that they have, and now I think many of them morally think that they're doing the the right thing. Just look at this example of uh, Marta Ladenburg, who was murdered in um, in Germany. I mean, her, her right. father was a, was a legal advisor uh, mm -hmm. to the European Commission in in 
in Brussels. He was working on uh, all kinds of, uh, ironically, of course, he was uh, helping refugees and she was also, I think, in our, on her spare time doing these kinds of things. And this is far from being an isolated case, despite what Merkel said. You know, it was actually just the other day it was revealed that about 1,576 sex crimes had occurred in Germany in 2015. I, th- I frankly Ooh. think it's higher than that, but these are just some of the officials and numbers coming out. And these are what this is what happens when you're forcing together, as you say, incompatible cultures. I mean, I'm not as easily. I understand what you're saying that we just, you know, we, we can't be mindless about this. We we need to question who's who's done this to us. At the same time, I do feel these people have a behavior that they must have held be responsible for as well, right? I mean, they can't just be let off the hook with, with this kind of criminal behavior, right? Mm-hmm. right? Now, you have addressed a very serious issue here, and I guess I would probably need the whole semester to cover all uh, all nooks and crannies, of, of uh, especially of the German case. Now, let's keep in mind, whether we like it or not, Germany is the center of Europe. So when we talk about the European Union, when we talk about Europe, we always, the first thing that comes to my mind is Germany. Germany is the center, it's the locomotive of Europe, whether it likes it or not. Now, Germany is certainly a very specific case. Now, again, I wrote about this extensively, and some of my colleagues, including Alain de Benoit, they wrote about this in French. I did some translations of it. Now, Germany is a a special case because, look, keep in mind that in order to understand the mindset of the of the establishment of the political establishment uh, in Germany, including many of those, so they call them. Uh, Hof historical, rather what they call the court historians and court uh, court intellectuals of the system, including their mainstream press, like the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, and then uh, Frankfurter Rundschau and uh, whatever the Spiegel magazine. Look, let's try to put things a little bit in a historical perspective. I don't want to bother you of your folks who are listening to us very much, but we need to put things always in perspective if we want to understand the suicidal, neurotic relationship of the German political class. It all goes back to 1945. I'm sure you understand what happened there. We are not going to go into historiography. We don't have much time for that. But do keep in mind that Germany was literally bombed into the Stone Age. And I'm sure most of our colleagues now, by now know that in the United States of America. And to a large extent, France was also bombed. Well, anyway, in, in Central Europe and so on. <clears throat> and of course, Germany, whether, whether it likes it, whether we want to admit it or not, is still a quote-unquote... Let me, let me put it diplomatically. It doesn't have a full-fledged sovereignty as other, quote-unquote, sovereign countries in, in the European Union. It certainly doesn't have as much sovereignty as Russia. And, of course, most of the German politicians, inclu- inclu- including some, in, excluding some marginal figures like from the NPD or uh, uh, Alternative for Germany, uh, Alternative for Deutschland, so on and so, so forth, the, most of those folks are just valiant servants of the system which was set up, which was established literally on the ruins of Germany in 1945. Hence the reason that they have to behave in such a, with, from our perspective, when, when you observe things from Sweden, when I observe things from Croatia, where people might be a little bit more proud, especially from Germany, and like if you consider the Trump phenomenon. When we look at the German, uh, how can I say, uh, servile uh, and uh, mim- mimic, okay, it's, it's a mimicry, it's a political mimicry. Germany doesn't have much luxury to uh, pursue a sovereign policy, sovereign foreign policy, including its sovereign, including um, including to reboot. How can I put it? Its own identity, because it immediately gets attacked as a Nazi country. They have the German. The German have the expression Nazi coil. The German. Uh, the German. The the Nazi stick. Every, whenever somebody raises his voice, like folks from the NPD or FDA, AFD, whenever they raise a voice against my, uh, foreign non-European migrations, whenever they say something which goes to the benefit of the German people, they're immediately smeared the next day by, by not just by liberal and leftist journalists in Germany, but all over the world, as a neo-Nazi country tempted by some Nazi demons, this is a standard rhetoric you, you hear, especially if you read Haaretz and if you read the Jerusalem Post, including if you read the New York Times and so on and so forth. So keep in mind this sense of, 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 uh, of uh, I call it the false victimology of Germany. Um, the, self, the self of, how can I say, I'm just looking for a nice word in anthropology, um, the sense of, of sin 
is constantly plaguing the German politicians. If I can just illustrate it, okay, here comes another idea. <clears throat> The German president, Gauck, it's just a ceremonial figure, it's not a big figure nonetheless. When he traveled, he was when he, last year, he was in Jerusalem, he said twice, literally, I'm probably not misquoting him, that the German identity depends uh, depends on the survival of Israel. Right. Okay? Yeah. So this gives you an idea to what extent this country is submitted to foreign yukazis, to foreign, how can I say, to foreign whims. And of course, the German political elites have to behave in such a fashion. I'm sure Madame Merkel is not that stupid, Frau Merkel. She knows certain things. We can now make jokes about her, her being unmarried, having no kids, and so on. Just trying to uh, to sort of mimic this liberal uh, this liberal uh, paradigm, as they call it, which was uh, which was set up after the Nuremberg trials in 45, 46, 47. But she knows certain things. Like she said the other week, last week, that there was a C CDU Congress in Munich, I think, yes, and she said, help me, help me, Hilfe, Hilfe. She's also a poor woman, a castrated woman, if I can put it that way, you know, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. And just like all of the German political class, she has been neuroticized so deeply, so profoundly that uh, what we are basically observing in Germany is just the regular outcome of this, I'll use the right word, brainwashing that the German people and the German elites have been subjected to over the last 45 years, let alone, and we could, we could, we could now talk about this for another semester, about the German criminal code, but penal code, which is incredibly harsh, you know, which many Americans, some of my friends in America can't even conceive how harsh it is. For even the minor jokes, if you crack a joke against a Turkish gastarbeiter, if a worker or something, you can land in prison, you know, you can yeah. have some serious, serious things, you can have, you know, your career can be ruined, you know, I, to some extent I also experienced that, but it was far from, from some of my colleagues who actually served long prison sentences just for doing some research, you know. <clears throat> so again, if you consider all those things, now I mentioned at the beginning Germany, but to a large extent what happens in Germany? on a psychological, on the media level, on the academic level, whatever happens in Berlin, the next day spills over into Eastern Europe and of course into Western Europe. France is also a country, you know, we could now debate about this, how tough it is. It also has very strict laws. Now, France in terms of, uh, well, nobody actually knows what the right uh, profile of the foreign migration is in, in France. Some of my colleagues, I mean, I'm talking about serious people, uh, tell me that there is about uh, that 20 percent of the French citizens who, you know, who are of non-European origin. Well, it's yeah. hard to say. Yeah. Definitely, uh, look, there is about seven or eight million Muslims there. I guess there might be, the, the, the figure might be higher even. I can't, I can't, I can't even say that. Now again, if I can just backpedal, and there are so many issues I would like you to, 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 to discuss here, but we don't have much time for it. Like as of two years ago, the French parliament, Assemblée uh, Nationale, what they call it, the French parliament dismissed, actually they stroke away, they, they brushed away this expression, la race, the race. So from now on, you don't use, not that you are not allowed, but you are not supposed to use in your scholarly or your official uh, treatises or your scripts or whatever you want to call it, the word race, because according to the French legislation, race no longer exists. Same so in Sweden. Again, they did the same yes, uh, same last in Sweden. year. Yeah. So again, you can't keep a track of all those newcomers, latecomers into France. But definitely, unlike unlike America, now keep in mind, I'm sure you know who you are. You live in Sweden for the time being, and we gotta we gotta uh, uh, we gotta um, convey this message to our friends in uh, in in the United States of America that uh, Europe is uh, three uh, one third. Uh, well, in terms of size, it is it is it has okay. It has a half a billion people. I'm talking Western and Central Europe. I'm not talking about Ukraine and Russia. It has a half a billion half a billion. 500 million people, and plus it's it's one third of, in terms of size, it's one third of the United States of America. So you had Texas, you had California, and you multiply it by two or th three times. Now, it's, it's a small, it's a claustrophobic area. It's a claustrophobic yeah. entity, the entire Europe. Now, keep in mind, like I live here in Zagreb, just to give you an idea to our listeners in the States, 
I, I sit on my bike. I'm, I'm five miles from the Slovenian border. You know, five miles, literally. I'm not joking. Five miles from the Slovenian border. Yeah. And in my car, I can make it to Klagenfurt, which is in southern Austria, in an hour and a half, okay? Which yeah. is about 100 miles from where I live now, in Zagreb, Croatia. These are small areas, small countries. I'm I'm two hours from Budapest. And again, look, I'm I'm in, in if I drive fast in my car, I avoid <laughs> driving car. I take a tram <laughs> instead of train. Uh, train. And I guess in, in Munich, I'm in five hours when, when, if, I, if I speed a little bit in my car. So again, this gives you an idea how small this whole country is and how actually at this stage it is literally being flooded. You know, we're talking them. I mean, look, from the purely logistical level, it doesn't work. It's bound That's right. To yep. The infrastructure. The there's, no, there's no places for these people to live. We're, we're, I mean, Sweden is a fairly large country compared to some of the other European countries. And, and still, you know, the infrastructure is not holding up. There's no places to live. Uh, they're not building fast enough. I, I just don't see how they're, what are they, how are they thinking here? How are they thinking that we're going to get out of this situation? You have addressed now the most important issue. I don't want to flatter you. And this is the role of ideas, the, the, the dominant ideas. Unfortunately, look, we now live in, a, in the times of, uh, in the age of mendacities and myths. Back, you know, look, I, I, I like reading classics. I'm pretty much an expert on some classics. I would, I would certainly at some different at different times and different latitudes, I would like to discuss, you know, Sophocles with you and some Homer a little bit. And anyway, uh, what I wanted to tell you that uh, back in the 17th and 18th century, our ancestors uh, here in Europe, they they had to abide by certain dogmas. They had to abide by certain myths because if they didn't, you know, they would go to prison or they would be burned. Yeah. They would be. There were the Inquisition was, you know, in especially in Catholic countries here in Austria, in France, you know, until basically until a, the period of enlightenment, until the mid 18th century, the people were burned here, right here in Zagreb. There were quote unquote witches, nice women, you know, nonconformist women who were burned, you know, yeah. were killed, were massacred because this was the dogma of the time. Now, let's face it. This dogma of egalitarianism, this dogma of economism, of permanent economic progress. Most people, even not most, but I will say many intelligent people I meet on the regular level, even some high officials here in Zagreb, I'm not going to mention their names. Look, they truly believe in those in this vernacular. They truly believe in equality. They truly believe in this permanent economic progress. And when I start to debate with them, there's no way. There's no way, no way, Jose, because they just simply, it's like a religious, it's like a secular dogma, you know. They yeah. believe in this permanent economic progress. And you just got to ask them, here. here's my suggestion. Ask them a question, a very rhetorical question. Where is the end stop of this progress? Because every everything that begins but has an end. So if you talk about an economic progress, progress is all liberals often do, then you've know, got to ask yourself a question. Where does it stop? Because at some point, you, your your income, your whatever, your your houses or your cars that you drive, your garbage that you throw throw back in your backyard, you, there must be a place, there must be a stop to it. You know, Everything has a beginning, everything must come to an end. And then equality. Look, this is something, the most bizarre thing that in our modernity, and I guess there are lots of books about this written, and certainly I'm also discussing that in my Book and again, uh, you know, the European who write uh, very much in detail this whole thing about equality. Uh, look, <laughs> look around this way that we are all unequal, but certainly we are not all equal. So we can address this issue as well. I'm sorry if I if I'm sidetracking you a little bit, if I'm getting a, a little bit, uh, uh, if I'm getting carried away with some of your questions. But this is a very important issue. It's a matter of life and death. It's not. It's no longer look. You know, I remember two day two years ago we we mentioned that we're talking about multiculturalism. I re remember quite vividly about this. It also mentioned ex Yugoslavia, which we used as a starting point for our discussion. You know, yeah. and why multiculturalism didn't work. However, now this time things are much much more serious. Look, I don't know what's going to happen next day here in Croatia. Is is this what we have to go through though? I mean, because if democracy or egalitarianism is kind of in itself a, a, a secular religion and it's a, it's a belief and it's a faith if people have faith as we as we know they are convinced that they are in the right nothing is going to change you're not going to change them with arguments it seems at this point unfortunately that the only thing we can do is to let them run the ship into the into the ground and 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 basically have it capsize i mean it, because i'm i'm not afraid of material th i'm not afraid of the infrastructure of uh, of of european cities and things like this i mean we've lost things in the past we've rebuilt we can rebuild things physically and everything else what i'm concerned about is the culture 
the uh, you know the human biodiversity, the racial makeup of of the different you know diverse groups that we have in Europe. Those are the precious things that have to that have to remain. But so far, I think we're seeing it, Tom. Kind of a we're not seeing an, an integration process where where a lot of these at least the new new people that have come in in the last two years here during the migrant migrant crisis. They're not like fitting in perfectly in our society and we are kind of merging with them or whatever. The, what's happening is that the parallel societies are developing and we're mm. developing conclaves maybe of them versus us. This is, of course, at the end of the day, going to be very detrimental and very dangerous. Uh, but if if the European elite had some kind of dream of a blended European people or something like Kalergi talked about and these other people, that's not happening, right? That's not actually occurring right now. Look, my, my biggest concern is, again, I mentioned earlier, this dominant ideas. The the fact of the matter is that the ruling elites, including their, call them scribes, call them their intellectuals, or what the, German, the Germans call them court historians and court intellectuals, who are well paid and well greased, well lubricated with money. They, I, I frequently ask myself, ask myself, and I do know some of those people. They respect me. They know where I'm coming from here, and I talk to them on both on the micro level and the macro level. I wonder sometimes, do they truly believe in what they're saying, or do they do it simply because uh, they because they're well paid? So they can't be in between. Let me just, uh, you know, I've been studying this uh, this uh, issue on, on the uh, from the first hand here back in, in Zagreb in Croatia when Yugoslavia fell apart. Let me just draw a parallel, if I may, and I also wrote about this in some of my books that I wrote in French anyway. And um, look, uh, what what when I came from the states here and I, I had a, I, I met President Tujman and of course I was uh, I was appointed here as a high diplomat at the at the Croatian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I was truly shocked at that time. I just couldn't realize, I couldn't believe my eyes, I couldn't believe my ears <laughs> to see so many former, I repeat, former communist Yugoslav official, former diplomats who literally in a matter of seconds or who in a matter of year or in months converted from the Yugoslav, uh, pan-Yugoslav and uh, communist uh, mindset to nationalist mindset, which tells me again how the human nature is fickle. So again, we'll see that uh, shortly, and I also wrote in one of my pieces about the Trump phenomenon, I'm sure we'll be observing that also with many quote-unquote liberal scholars and uh, egalitarian scholars or egalitarian scribes from different journals in the United States of America. If if Trump really uh, embeds himself, if he really, uh, how can I, if he really finds a, if he really strengthens his position as the president of the United States of America, and if the if the uh, cultural environment begins to shift somewhat or becomes more uh, more how can I say uh, less stringent, then I'm not ruling out that he may be uh, experiencing the inflation of brown nosers, if I can put it bluntly. But in other words, he might also be uh, uh, he might be also co-opted by the by the by the media by the media which is at this stage very much on the left there's no question about it, which is very much a promo polio marxist very much egalitarian very much a multicultural and i noticed i, I gave you again uh, the example of ex yugoslavia and how many of those officials literally all of them former communist officials shifted first the first gear was nationalism and then afterwards after 2000 they began to to move towards Atlanticism and towards Americanism. It was all the mimicry. So I cannot rule out if some new ideas pop up on the block or if they become popular, even among young students, they will probably be our best supporters. <laughs> Again, if I can make another parallel, if you allow me, this uh, brings me to 1933. I was just reading the other day some of the memoirs of, of Goebbels. I'm sure, you know, David Irving brought up a uh, this book by uh, the Goebbels. It's very interesting. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just an archival material. It's good to understand the psychology of the National Socialist uh, uh, big bosses, but also the, the some of their opponents. It's interesting to note that uh, that back in uh, and just uh, just uh, for your info, uh, 1933, uh, just prior to the uh, just the, the the year in January 33, there was about one million, a little bit less, 900,000. 900,000 uh, members of National Socialist Party. And this number then grew to 8.8 .8 million by late 44. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that by 1936 and 37, 
you had many National Socialist members who exited that party, who left that party, who gave up. Why? Because they were they disliked those those how can I say those newcomers? They disliked those opportunists. So basically, we got to ask ourselves a question as a summary now for this little talk that I'm having a long talk. We have to ask ourselves to what extent we are dealing with opportunists, not just in uh, among our, among our, among hostile elites. Uh, uh, and our detractors, but also in our own rank and file. And to what extent are we really dealing with true believers? This is an issue I would like to cover a little bit. True believers on one hand, in other words, those, if you want to call them starry-eyed uh, uh, multiculturalists who are now raving and ranting about this end of the world in this beautiful la-la land of multiculturalism on the one hand, or simply opportunists. And in my view, it seems to me that mostly, most folks are opportunists. They just go there you know, ubi bene, ubi patria, ubi patria, wherever it's good, you go where it is. You know, you go where the, you, you go with the traffic, okay, as the Americans say. So yeah. this is an issue I, I've been dealing with more from the psychological level. So again, I would, if I may, instead of just uh, uh, talking and talking, I would like to refer you again to my book. And of course, if you folks, you don't have to read myself, but look at the bibliography of my book. I'm definitely, I've been very much influenced by Wilfredo Pareto, a great uh, French-Italian scholar wrote about the circulation of elites. So read him, folks. It was translated into English. It's a good book, very scholarly book. And also Gustave Le Bon, who wrote about the psychology of the masses. So there are lots of other books as he wrote. It's incredibly, uh, incredibly well, uh, his portrayal of this, of this betrayal of the elites, how, in fact, the elites... Uh, move from one side to another. Well, look at, the, look at the, for instance, even the German, early German, the surviving German elites back in 45, 40, 46, 47, 48, many of them were former National Socialist uh, members. Well, the NATO itself, you know, was, was actually formed in Germany in 1955, uh, basically with the, the former German uh, SS uh, officers and so on. Again, I'm probably sidetracking you again, but keep in mind, this is my main point. We have to distinguish between true believers and opportunists. In my view, I yeah. think it's, it's opportunists who actually run the show now, and I cannot rule out, provided we have enough intellectual energy, provided we have enough uh, uh, of alt-right, if I can say, spread out all around the uh, all around Europe, provided we can capture and kidnap, if I can say kidnap from our enemies, this cultural hegemony. That's I'm right. pretty much sure we'll have the inflow, a massive influx of uh, of people and supporters who will back us up and who will provide provide a counter-revolution, if I can put it that, provide uh, a, a terrain for the revival and for the resurrection of Europe, if I can put it somewhat romantically. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. No, it's fine. I mean, that is, it is a battle of ideas. There is a willpower that needs to be there in place. Maybe we can talk a bit more about that in the second segment. You know, there's many more things I want to get into. This is interesting with the, you know, the psychology of the masses and, you know, why people actually, why why they do go along. And, 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 and the fact is that if we do manage to steer the, the, the acceptance of these kinds of issues that we concerned with into the mainstream and shift the window, if you will, many people are not going to have a problem going along with that, if you will, or, or discussing the framework of these ideas instead of, instead of being so afraid of them as they are now. So that's one item I want to discuss more with you in the second. And then also I want to talk more about the outcome, maybe, you know, of the migrant crisis. Uh, if that's going to continue now in, in spring and summer 20, 2017, we can get into Trump a little bit too and the influence that he might have over, you know, European politics. There's, there's much more to, you know, get into that. So uh, but before we take a break, Tom, just do mention a couple of your of a, co a couple of your titles because I think it's important that people know uh, what they should pick up if they want to learn more about some of your ideas and some of your work. Um, is the uh, the the book uh, Against Democracy and Equality the European New Right? Is that a good start for people? Would you say? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, look, uh, first, and I don't want to now brag, and I, I well, I'll let me be quite frank with you. My books are, to some extent, my ID, my own ID. So I guess my, my personality, my character can best be transcribed when, when you read my prose. And I would suggest you my book Against Democracy and Equality because this was my doctoral dissertation at the very liberal-minded uh, university, University of California, very leftist-minded folks. So I'm not using some heavy words, and I guess it's very well annotated. It has a huge bibliography. And if you don't feel like reading the book itself, it has about 300 pages, you can just read, you can just go over the, the bibliography. Plus it has a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, preface by... Paul Gottfried, and of course, by Alain de Benoit himself. 
And of course, some of those ideas I, I, I trail on later on in my book, Homo Americanus, which, is, which was prefaced by my friend Kevin McDonald. So again, I certainly don't know one of folks, you know, bombard you with names and drop names around, but I would suggest you to read definitely uh, Wilfredo Pareto, I mentioned in sociology, Conrad Lawrence in sociobiology, or, and of course, you know, Carl uh, Schmidt in political and in, uh, international affairs and in international law. And then, of course, uh, Oswald Spengler in uh, political philo- uh, in philo- philosophy of history. And, of course, Nietzsche, of course, is a starting point in, in philosophy. So these are some of the authors. But then here again, this is an important issue, too. I hope that now with Trump and not just with this changing of climate, we'll be able to resurrect, resurrect our huge heritage from Sweden all the way down to Croatia, from, if you wish, from Ibsen up north, or from Knut Hamsen, if you wish, yeah. from Norway, all the way down to, to, to uh, why not, Dante Alighieri, you know, also right about the hell in his own fashion. So this is the most important issue, folks, and uh, uh, Henry, we have to resurrect and popularize, in a simple language, our huge literary Adva- uh, 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 advantage that we have. Unfortunately, this advantage has been completely sidetracked. It has been eclipsed. It has been hidden. It has been forbidden by the by the media and by the educational system in the east, in the east and in the west over the last seventy years. So I hope we will now have a chance to 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 debate it and to theorize more about some of those ideas which have been not just removed, but they have been also criminalized. Yeah, exactly. Very important. Okay, there's a couple of links there, folks, that we'll have up on the uh, on our website, of course, uh, to some of Tom's uh, books. He has a Twitter. He has a personal website. We'll add those and some of the other uh, recommendations that he had as well. So definitely check the uh, the reference links for this show. But we're going to take a short break here, folks, and then we're going to continue with Tom Sunik in the second segment. And if you do want to join us, do sign up for a membership with us, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to the second hour. And, of course, everything that we produce, go to RedEyesMembers.com. That's the best place to go. And uh, yeah, as I said, much more to discuss with Tom Sunik in the second segment. So uh, stick around. We will be right back. Thank you for listening.